morning. We're so grateful that you have joined us this morning, and it's our honor to be able to recognize our teachers today. Um, as you can see, we don't do things by ourselves. We always do things together collaboratively, so I have a very good friend here to help me, and he's actually going to start us out. If I can invite all of the teachers to come up here, no matter where you teach, what school, university setting, um, anybody. If you're a teacher, faculty, uh, keeping all those stuff, come on up. Join, join the crew. Oh, just come up in front of here. It's just come up here in front of her. Come on, come on, get over there, get over there. All right, so uh, we have a lot of new members who have moved into our area. Uh, some of you I don't even know. Some of you don't know me. You're probably blessed in that regard. To, to over time, you will get tired of, of knowing me. Uh, that's okay. Um, I'm going to go down the line and ask you to give your name and what you're going to teach here as we go through. I'm Lana Rasmussen, and I'm going to be helping Mrs. Bombach um, in grades three through six doing history. I'm Caleb Rasmussen, and I mainly teach high school English. I'm Kimberly Baumbach, and I'm going to be teaching with Mrs. Rasmussen, grades three to six. I'm Brenda Muth, and I'm going to do the PAE registrar work and help her in math and help Mr. Vixie keyboarding and whatever else. And just keep him busy. My name is David Goimer, and I teach mathematics, physics, and soccer. My name is Karen Vixie, <laughs> and I will be an aide throughout the school and, and uh, the handler for Mr. Vixie. <laughs> My name is D.R. Vixie, and I will be principal of the PAE, but I will also be teaching seventh and eighth grade and I wanted to clarify that Lana is not just an aide w uh, working with uh, Kimberly. She also will be um, a teacher of record for uh, several of the classes as well. Hi, I'm Melissa Mugi, and I'll be teaching K-1 and 2 at PA. My name is Laura Moss, and I will be teaching science, math, and art at the high school. My name is Sean McMurphy, and I am going to be teaching uh, history, world history, and economics slash civics at the high school. Um, I'm Linda Nystrom. I teach religion one and two, and I'm also the academic counselor and um, chaplain at Paradise Adventist Academy. I probably shouldn't have gotten up because I'm the only one that's teaching with them, but my name is Lisa Algin and I teach mathematics in high school for Butte County Office of Education. And yes, you should have gotten up. I'm going to invite our elders to come up. We're going to have a prayer that Maureen's going to have for us, and if you're uh, an elder in this church, we'd like you to come up and, and lay hands or sit there as a congregation and, and uh, pour out your blessings through the laying on of hands. While they are coming up, I want to make sure that you all understand that um, there's a small gift card in those bags along with something special in there. And yesterday, the vendor who gave us the gift cards notified that one of them came to us blank. So if you're the one who gets a blank gift card, come and see me. I've got a replacement for you. So, Shall we bow our heads? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today in humbleness and gratitude. We celebrate your mighty power, you who created the universe, yet you care about our needs, you who know us intimately and love us unconditionally anyway. We bow before you today in grateful adoration. We rest in your righteousness and we bask in your blessings. 
And today, we honor and thank you for the individuals who have chosen to follow your calling, those who have dedicated themselves to help us to train up a child in the way he should go. And we ask today, Lord, that an extra measure of your wisdom and grace be poured out abundantly upon these special people, the ones we call teachers. These are the individuals you have called to be leaders, those who allow your love to be reflected to our students and their families. And Lord, we are blessed by their commitment and dedication to your service. We know that your faithfulness is already evident with our community, and we are in awe of how you have continued to answer our every prayer for our schools. We believe that you have an amazing plan for this coming year, Lord, and we are anxious to see your plans unfold. Flood us with your abundant mercies. Let our students see you shining through these faithful and gifted individuals, and let our churches feel your presence throughout this coming school year. And we ask this in the greatest of names. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. Oh, come on. Are you not happy? Amen. Tom's always happy. He's the happiest guy I know. Can you all agree that it's good to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. That's what I'm talking about. I want to thank Pastor Hamilton for allowing me to speak. It's been a while. In fact, it's been 20 seven years since I've spoken to a crowd of folks and shared the word of the Lord with them. Let me give you a little backstory. In the early 90s, the General Conference had global mission. Our church, Glenna's and my, my wife, we were in Southern California at the time, and we were part of that. And so in 1994, we went to Russia in 1995, we went to Latvia. In 1996, we went back to Russia in this program. And we were blessed more than we can think. Well, during the time we were in Latvia, I was asked, tasked, told to preach. I got to preach twice a week. And one sermon stands out in particular. I don't speak Russian or Latvian fluently, so I had, to have, I had to have an interpreter, and her name was Maria. And back in those days, there was a phrase that we used called, get out of town. Yeah, some of you are nodding your heads. Well, I incorporated that in my sermon. And as I was going along, I get out of town, put the phrase in. And dear Maria, she translated and to my shock, everyone stood up and headed towards the doors. And I leaned over and I go, Maria, what did you just say? She says, I told him to go home. <laughs> Don't go home, okay? Let me finish first, then you can go home, but have a meal. I'd like to pray but I'm going to kneel because I feel I have to. I am not worthy to give this message, and I'm going to humble myself and get on my knees and pray. If you feel inclined, please do. If not, please sit, or if you want to stand, whatever your mode of prayer is, please do. Father in heaven, we come to you this day seeking your presence and your face. Father, you've given me a word to share, and I am not worthy. I pray that you would take over my mind and my heart, that you would speak the words that need to be heard. Father, bless this time. We know you will. Your spirit is here. We've invoked his, his invitation. And you've promised that if two or three are gathered, you are here too. 
thank you for this opportunity to serve you. And may it glorify and honor your name. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The theme of my sermon is called The Battle. You are in a battle for your soul and for your eternity. If you have your Bible or any electronic device or whatever you use these days, please turn to Job chapter 1. It's right after the book of Esther and before the book of Psalms. Job chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Here in this first verse, we get a character sketch of Job. He's blameless. He's upright. One who fears God and shuns or turned away from evil. He has a large family, seven sons and three daughters. He has 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a partridge in a pear tree. It doesn't say that last part, but he's a, he's, he's a wealthy man. The Bible also says he was the greatest man of all the people of the East, which means he was a very powerful man. So he's both powerful and he's rich. Now his sons would throw feasts, and they would invite their sisters and their brothers. It doesn't say in the scripture that Job was invited, so he doesn't know what's going on at these parties. So just in case they're doing, being, saying, whatever, something wrong, he does burnt offerings. Because he doesn't want them to be, how shall I say it? By the wrongness of their doings, he doesn't want them to be lost. So he does these burnt offerings. Down in verse 6, there's a day when the sons of God present themselves before the Lord. Now, there's a debate about who these sons of God are. I've taken the vote that it could be understood as angels. So angels, like men, are created beings and are, in this sense, the sons of God. Satan shows up. Now, my wife knows that I've got quite the imagination. So I'm going to share with you how I feel Satan showed up there. Sound about right? God asked Satan where he's come from. Satan says he's come from roaming the earth. God asks him if he's considered his servant Job. Now notice that Satan is aware that Job is a God follower because the very first thing he says, he starts an argument with God. Satan that argues that Job follows God because he shows him favoritism. He's put a hedge about him and protected him. And he says to God, stretch out your hand and surely he will curse you to your face. God goes, okay, but you can't harm him. Satan heads back to earth and immediately Job loses all his possessions. Servants come to him and exclaim, Sabian raiders took the oxen and donkeys and killed the servants. Fire fell from God in heaven and killed the sheep and the servants. Chaldeans raided the camels and took them and killed the servants. It doesn't sound like a good day to be a servant of Job. The great wind blew down the house where your sons and daughters were eating and drinking and killed all your sons. Now, notice what Job does in verse 20. It says, Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped. Now, don't you find that strange? Job loses all his possessions and his sons, and what does he do? 
he worships. He does not charge God with all these disasters. Job filters everything through God because God is all he knows. He knows his life, his family, his possessions are all from God. Verse 21, he says, Naked I came forth from the womb of my mother, and naked I shall return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes it away. Finish it with me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Job has not sinned nor charged God with any wrong. He is faithful even at this great a cost. So when hard or difficult times come to you, how do you respond? I don't do what Job did. I fly off the handle. I get mad. I throw things. Do you worship like Job? How do you handle it? Everybody's different. So everything is taken from him except his wife, and I haven't figured that one out yet. Again, in chapter 2, we have another meeting with the sons of God, and Satan shows up. Satan sees that taking away all Job's stuff and his family isn't enough. So he sets out and says to God, let me have him. And God says, okay, but you can't kill him. So again, Satan heads down to earth and strikes Job with painful boils from head to toe, and Job sits and scrapes himself in ashes. Verse 9 comes along, and his wife says to him, curse God and die. No, I really don't understand why he kept the wife around. Verse 10, Job responds to that and says, you speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all these things, Job did not sin with his lips. Now Jesus has something to say about what comes out of a man's mouth. Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34. O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks? Job has just revealed his heart towards God. So it begs to ask the question, why trials? Why do we have the problems that we do? We're good people. We pay our taxes. Well, some of us pay our taxes. We do good things. We don't harm anybody. We don't rob banks. We, we're good people. So why do we have these problems? Well, there are reasons. And I'd like to share just a few of them with you. Romans 8.28, we know this one. And we know that all things work together to, for good. To those who love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, for the testing of your faith produces patience, and let patience have its perfect work, making you whole and complete, lacking nothing. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 4 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, this is the hard verse. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Why trials? Well, here's some of your answers. Because you love God. All things for work for your good, both the good and the adverse. It helps you grow your faith. It helps you to learn patience, to know his peace in the storms of your life, to live by grace, to experience his presence, to have hope in him. I got a question for you. Did you really think that following Jesus was going to be easy? At the end of chapter 2, Job's friends come to comfort him. And from chapters 
Three to eight, Job laments his life, and he, begin, and he goes back and forth with his friends about what has happened and what is happening. I'd like to read chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. After this, Job, tore his ro- Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job spoke and said, May the day perish on which I was born, and the night in which it is said, A male child is conceived. May that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor the light shine upon it. May darkness and the shadow of death claim it. May a cloud settle on it. May the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, may darkness seize it. May it not be included among the days of the year. May it not come into the number of the months. Oh, may that night be barren. May no joyful shout come into it. This is dark stuff. May those who curse it, who curse the day, those who are ready to arouse Leviathan. May the stars of its morning be dark. May it look for light, but have none, and not see the dawning of the day, because it did not shut up the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide sorrow from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Why did the knees receive me, or why the breast that I should nurse? For now, I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep. Then I would have been at rest. Do you think Job could have used a little counseling? So for six chapters, Job laments his life. His friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar are convinced and try to convince him that he has done something wrong or evil and God is punishing him for it. The prevailing thought of the day was if you're rich, God is blessing you. If you're poor, you're under God's curse. Now, when we started, Job was both rich and powerful which is contrary to the thought of rich being blessed and poor being undercursed. So I see a problem with that narrative, but there's a different problem. Do you see what it is? Job's friends are judging him by what they see. They forget his reputation, his character, and their own relationship with him. They aren't taking into consideration who Job is, but rather by appearance what has happened to him. Jesus has something to say about judging as well. Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 7, and verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. In John chapter 7, verse 24, it says, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteousness. Did you catch what I just said? In Matthew, he's saying, don't judge. In John, he's saying, if you judge, judge with righteousness. Whose righteousness, if we are put into a position to judge, are we to use? God's righteousness. We are not worthy. The last years I worked, I worked down in, in uh, Orville, and I had to drive through a pretty poor part of town. And every morning after I got off the freeway and got on the streets to get to work, and every evening when I got on the streets to go back home, I saw very unfortunate people, less fortunate than I. They were addicted to something. They were homeless. And Alan got, his, Alan got on his hobby horse every day. And he'd drive and he'd see these folks and he'd go, man, why don't you get a job? Man, why don't you clean your life up? Why don't you get a haircut? Well, skip the haircut part. <laughs> why don't you take care of yourself? And that went on for months. One day when I was driving home, getting ready to get on the freeway, I looked across the street, and there was this young girl there, and she did not look like in good shape. She was pretty disheveled. 
clothes all awry and just, she looks like she'd been having a tough time. And true to form, Alan started in on her. Well, I didn't get into my first sentence. And as clearly as you hear my voice today, God spoke to me. And he says, Alan, you have no right to judge this girl because you don't know anything about her. That rebuke hurt bad. And I repented on the spot. And I made it a practice that when I see folks that are less fortunate than me, I don't put them down. I pray for them. They need our prayers. Whether they realize it or not, they do. Let's jump to chapter 9 of Job. Chapter 9. Here, for a few chapters, Job defends the character of God. In verses 1 through 3 it reads, Then Job answered and said, Truly I say it is so, but how can a man be righteous before God? If anyone wished to contend with him, he could not answer him, not one time out of a thousand. Job knows man's righteousness is useless before God. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 64, 6. You know this verse. We, we are all as an unclean, and our righteousness are as, finish it for me, filthy rags. Job also knows not to argue with God. You can't answer him one in a thousand. I have another question for you. Have you tried to argue with God? Did you win the argument? I didn't think so. Verse 4. God is wise in heart and mighty in strength who has hardened himself against him and prospered. Untold wisdom. Wisdom that far exceeds anything we will ever know this side of eternity. Listen to what it says in Romans 11, verses 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches of both the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has first given to him and it shall be compensated to him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to be glory forever and ever. Can you say amen? Verses 5 through 7. He removes the mountains as, and they do not know. When he turns them over in his anger, he shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble. He commands the sun and it does not rise. He seals off the stars. He alone spreads out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. God's untold power. Psalm 33 verse 9 says, For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood. Can you understand that? I can't understand that. It's too big. Isaiah 55, verse 11, So shall my word be, which goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall certainly do what I sent it to do. God says it, it is done. It's a deal. There's no going back. Verse 9 reads, He made the bear, Orion, and the Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. This is one of my favorite verses. Psalm 147, verses 4 and 5. He appoints the number of the stars. He calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord, Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Now, Glenn and I, we live out in the county. We live on a dirt road with nine houses on one side. The rest of it is just ravines and rattlesnakes and all kinds of critters. No street lights. So when there's no moon, it's pitch black. The sky at night, 
It's black velvet. And all you see is stars everywhere. You see the constellations. You see shooting stars. You see satellites. You see planets. It's unbelievable. The Milky Way galaxy, of which we are part of, have 100 to 400 billion, with a B, stars. Traveling at the speed of light, it would take 150,000 light years to travel from one end of the Milky Way to the other. Now multiply those stars, 100 to 400 billion, by the 500 billion, with a B, known galaxies. David, that's a, that's, a, that's a math problem for you. That's, the estimate is about 10 to the 24th power. That's 10 with 24 zeros behind it. Glenna won't let me near the checkbook. Let's try to figure that out. It's not going to happen. Verse 10 reads, He does great things past finding out, yes, wonders without number. Now, are you ready for something even more fantastic than what I just told you? Are you sitting down? Well, obviously you are. From Isaiah 49, verses 15 and 16, it reads this way. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget. Yet I will not forget you. See, I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. The stars all have a name. He's named the stars. Your name is in the palms of his hands. He cannot forget you. He will not forget you. And the wall, in Hebrew, that means protection. So you are protected by him. Is that fantastic? Does it sound like a fairy tale? Sometimes when I read this stuff, I think, can this really be true? Can it really be true? Glenn and I have talked, it, talked about it more than once. So how can we believe it? What is the key for us to believe these fantastic things? Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Therefore, we walk by faith and not by sight. Verses 13 through 23, Job seems to be in a terrible quandary. He's trying to figure out if God is great and merciful or if he's indiscriminate in his punishment. Verse 22 says, it is all one thing. Therefore, I say he destroys the blameless and the wicked. In other words, if you're within arm's reach, God's arm's reach, he's going to smack you. And God's got long arms. My mom used to tell a story when we were growing up. My mom was the one of 12 children. She grew up in Kansas to uh, Russian immigrants. And she used to tell the story that when Grandma Galliard got mad about anything and everything, regardless of whether you were at fault or not, if you were at an arm's reach, guess what you got? She whacked you. God's not that way not that way at all. Job still holds to his innocence. Listen to what it says in verse 21. I am blameless, blameless, yet I do not know myself. I despise my life. He still holds on to his innocence, but he's not quite sure yet. It, it's, it's getting edgy for him. Jump down to verse 24. And it reads this way. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? For the first time in this story, Job has a new thought. Job questions who, if not God, could be doing this. Is there someone else? Now remember, Job knows only God. So it's come to the conclusion that these events must be coming from God until now. 
All this time, Job is focused on God not doing him wrong, yet bad things are happening to him. Bad things are happening to him. It's not making sense, so Job now begins to question. He's done all the right things. He's sacrificed. He's tithed. He's done the worship. He's done nothing wrong, yet all this bad stuff is happening to him, and he can't figure it out. You ever had somebody come up to you and say, why is God punishing me? Why am I in this trouble? Have you ever noticed on a big ticket item or contract, down at the very bottom in very small letters, it says, and any act of God. Do you know what those acts are? Earthquake, fire, flood, hurricane. It infers that God does bad things to people. Does the God you know and love do bad things to you? This is what I believe. About the circumstances you're in or I'm in, it's not that God is making you suffer. God is taking what Satan is throwing at you, and he's working out his sovereign will of which we cannot understand for his glory and your good. Remember what it said in Romans 8, 28? All things work. Isaiah 55, verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. He's using the circumstances in your life to refine you. How do you refine something? Fire. He talks about it. Here's two verses that are, to me, a big encouragement. 1 Peter chapter 12, verse 4, and it reads, Dear friends, do not be astonished that a trial by fire is occurring to you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in the degree that you have shared in the sufferings of Christ, so that his glory is revealed, you, so that when his glory is revealed, you may also rejoice and be glad. 1 Peter 1, verse 7 says, Such trials show the proven character of your faith, which is much more valuable than gold, gold that is tested by fire even though it is passing away and will bring praise and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. If you come away with anything today, come away with this. Trials are not from God, but he takes advantage of them for his glory and your good. Now, we know from chapter 1 that Satan's the antagonist. He's been behind this thing the whole time. Job, on the, other, on the other hand, he hasn't a clue that it's not God. Remember, God is all he knows. So as we continue to study, something began to bug me, and it was this. Is God ever going to reveal to Job who the bad guy is? Or is he just going to let Job go blithely along in life and never reveal it to him? Well, he does. 32 chapters later. If you'll turn to chapter 41 of Job, the first 33 verses describe a beast called Leviathan. In Hebrew, it's Leviathan, and it's defined as serpent, crocodile, constellation of a dragon. It's also a symbol of Babylon and mourning. Let's take a look at the last verse of chapter 41. Here it says, He holds every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. What does that sound like to you? Remember the definition? Serpent, crocodile, dragon, Babylon. Who is that? It's Satan. He's the problem. Finally, Job has his answer. Satan, the dragon, the serpent, is the cause of his and our problems. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 44 as he describes Satan. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. 
everything that he says about God punishing you is a lie. He wants to make you think, his goal is to make you think that God's the bad guy and he's the cause of all your problems. Don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie. And he will come at you hard and he will come at you fast and he will come at you consistently. Believe that God is working out his sovereign will for his glory and your good. Do you really want to know, do you really want to know what God thinks of us? It says it in the Bible. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 13, read thusly. For I know the thoughts which I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of, and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And you shall call on me, and you shall go away and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. We are not immune to suffering, even as a Christian. In fact, the Bible says we will all suffer, both the good and the bad. But the righteous suffer for a different reason. Suffer. You're gonna, if you're going to suffer, suffer for Christ's sake. If you are suffering and you don't know why, try what Job did. Worship. Now, don't tear your robe or shave your head. That's a little over the top. Listen to what it says in Philippians. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and by supplication and thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. In Job chapter 42, verse 5, I had heard of you by the hearing of my ear, but now my eye has seen you. Job has been faithful. Job has been humble, and his faith and humility have seen him through the worst ordeal of his life. Through this whole thing, he comes to the end, and he has seen God. One day, too, we will see God not as in a foggy mirror or through sin, but face to face. Finally, the end of the story. Job is restored with twice as much as he had before when he prayed for his friend, lives 140 more years, sees his children and his grandchildren to the fourth generation. Remember, you're in a battle for your soul, for your eternity. And with perseverance and faith, we too, like Job, will finally see God face to face. There's a beautiful verse in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, which refers to the church at Ephesus, but I believe we can claim this too. The last sentence of that verse reads like this. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The tree of life symbolizes eternal life, free from death and suffering. In the paradise of God, the Garden of Eden. Have faith, persevere, have hope. For we know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Amen.
Father in heaven, we are so, so thankful that you hear us when we call, regardless of our situation, good or adverse. Your ear low, bends low to hear the prayers of your children. I pray that this day we could immerse ourselves in your presence, in your word, in thought, word, and deed, conversation, everything. This is your holy day. Help us to keep it as best we can through your strength. In Jesus' name, amen.